Okay. Uh, I can already see the first thing where I forgot to fill in the rest of that, but it's all right, the rest is fine. All right, so disclaimer, first of all, I'm an early PhD, so where you've all been playing Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, whatever, I'm going to come and play Twinkle Twinkle for you now. So what I'm doing is very much more basic, and that's probably the right decision. But anyway, there's lots of pictures, and I know it's the end of the day, so I will hopefully not be... There we go. So, starting off, I'm just going to be covering basically the same things, oh, there we go, that everyone else has talked about all day. So for a transcendental entire function, we have stability on the Fatou set, instability slash chaos on the Julia set, but more importantly for escaping set, oh sorry, more importantly for us with transcendental entire functions, we have the escaping set. And also, do stop me at any point if you have question or complaints even. Okay. For a transcendental function, um, we have questions about where we are allowed to invert and where we can't. Because inverting is always helpful and it's a main question. And standard knowledge, critical values. We have our inverse function theorem for that. That's no surprise. But then we, as it's already been mentioned and well covered today, we have asymptotic values as well, i.e. values that are achieved by travelling along these long curves and whatever. Uh, an example, if you can think about it for a second, go along the negative real axis with the exponential, you approach zero, but you never actually quite hit it. So that means that zero is an asymptotic value for the exponential function. All right, and in case you forgot it from the last talk or the previous ones, that's the set of singular values for f. All right, and slightly longer form, it's the set where if you take any neighbourhoods, you can't invert, or if you do invert, there's one branch that isn't bijective. All right, so because we've now got this set of singular values and whatever, we can start classifying by these set of uh, singularities. And we've already mentioned them today. We've got the Spicer class S and Eremenko Lyubich class B. So S for Spicer and B for, well, neither of those. But what we'll see is for, yeah, so Spicer class S is for when the singular set is finite, as in it's got finitely many points. For S for Spicer, and the B comes up. Or have I got an, ex oh, no, an example first? So the Spicer class of cos is just minus one plus one. So nothing too scary yet. And I think there's a lag. There we go. But for class B, the B is for bounded. So when your set of singularities or rather singular values is bounded, then it's in class B. However, it doesn't mean you have finitely many. For sine z over z, that's got infinitely many, whereas they're all bounded by one. Um, the calculation for that basically shows you're solving for z equals tan of z. And so the modulus is cos of z at those points. It's a shortcut. So what? I mean, what's the purpose? What's the point? But now we've got this region where we know we can contain all of the issues. We can just work around it instead. OK. And finally, lots of pictures. And I'm very happy to say these are done in paint with my fair hand. If I had my way, they'd be in crayon. So for those of you who are adept at LaTeX pictures, I'm not sorry. Okay. So first of all, if we consider the singular set and then we add in zero and f of zero, I'll say in a second why. Nope, there we go. Told you it was bad. So got all of our points there. There may be infinitely many, but they're bounded. Let's put them into a disk around the origin. All right, there's the boundary and the red bit outside. We're going to call that w. All right. Now we're going to work on 
W, which is the complement of the closure of D. Let me catch up on this. Okay, and once we've done that, there we go. We'll take the inverse image of W. Okay, so those red bits are pre images. Okay. Now, the original question is why did we include zero and in f of zero? Well, if you've taken the inverse image of f of zero, then you skip zero. And that means we can take logarithm or inverse exponential. And because on the right hand side, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself there. So take logarithms. So the outside of that disk, we're going to take the inverse image, and that'll be h. And we can take the inverse exponential upstairs, and that'll become a half plane, right half plane. And then by picking one of those components on the left hand side that we saw, take one of them, inverse exponential of that. Well, the exponential is 2 pi i periodic vertically. So we've just taken a single one of these and then the inverse exponent or logarithm there. And then we take the inverse exponential up there. And whenever there's four pictures arranged like this, it's going to commute at some point. Well, that's what we want. And Again, this is where I plead ignorance and youth and experience. And I won't go into details, but it does commute. Yes. And here's a much more professional rendering of what I just did. And that's from Dave Sixsmith. So thank you, Dave, if you're watching. Okay. So this is a nice picture, and it's the standard construction that we always do. Okay. Now, that upstairs function is the logarithmic transform of f. And what we do is we try and work upstairs with these logarithmic transforms. And we sort of hopefully working with these things that are easier to construct and come up with ourselves. By doing that, hopefully we'll have something downstairs. So up to now, we've started downstairs and we've gone up. Ideally, can we work up and come down? And we can. And once again, I realize it's the end of the day. I'm not going to try and do details. But in section seven of the paper by Remper, Rottenfuss, uh, Ruckert, and Schleicher, there you go. Um, using some approximation theory, Cauchy integrals, by creating this artificial tract upstairs that goes to the half plane, we can derive some class B function downstairs. And that is actually done professionally in that paper. OK. And this does extend continuously to the boundary by Cara Theodore. I think it's Cara, the Cara Theodore Torhurst in full. Anyway, so before I race too far, any questions so far? Either here or in Zoom land? Good. I'm going to carry on. OK, now I'm actually going to talk about the title, which only took 15 minutes nearly. OK, uh, as already mentioned by Leticia earlier, uh, for two notice that that sign family has these curves that all go to infinity under iteration, i.e. part of the escaping set. And again, if you didn't catch it the first couple of times, in 1989, Eremenko directly studied the escaping set for an arbitrary entire function, or transcendental one, actually. And he conjectured that, that the escaping set has unbounded components, whereas he proved it for the closure that that holds. So that's the weak form of Eremenko's conjecture, that we have the unbounded components. But seems to be a bit of a lag. There we go. As I just said, so that's the weak form. And then there's also the strong form, which says every point in this escaping set can be connected to infinity 
strictly within the escaping set. So all the points in the escaping set are on these Kev or Devaney hairs. Oops, sorry. All right, so that's two out of three of the title done. Okay, so this is where I use the acronym prematurely. And I may have changed the order of the R's, but it's a mute. Anyway, so in the paper by Triple RS, this conjecture, the strong one, was shown to be false even within class B. So we didn't even have to go out of something we're comfortable with. But all is not lost. There is, if I look, there we go. It's not all bad news. We can retrieve some good stuff. So if our function is of finite order, that is the double logarithm of the modulus of f of z is of big O log of mod z as z goes to infinity, then Eremenko's conjecture does hold. And also in the paper, it's it, um, mentioned that finite compositions of finite order functions do this as well, but that's past what I've done so far. Okay, now the counterexample. So here we are, we're on to the third part of the title. That was quick. And the way this is done is we construct this tract, which is going to be done with right angle lines and it all extends straight off to the far right and by exploiting properties within like hyperbolic metrics stuff like that we can come up with these geodesics such that because we have a conformal isomorphism um sorry was it uh, geodesics will map to other geodesics or their pre-images will be geodesics Okay, and thankfully there's a lot more pictures again, so. There we go. And again, we're back to uh, shoddy paint drawings, but anyway, so this is roughly what happens. So this tract, the rectangular thing, sits in a right half plane and it extends off to the right. So that continues all the way. And we have these wiggles. And by the way, these geodesics are constructed, in the paper, there's an explicit relation that's done. We can come up with a contradiction which ends up by saying, if you do pass between these two things, you must have had two that did it earlier, or that did it before that, and it comes back. So the details would take far too long to go through because it's just formula, 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 but hopefully the pictures will convince you of how it works. Okay, and this is just following the notation from the paper. So we have big R, so these are radii. These green segments are simply just parts of semicircular geodesics in the half plane, sense at the origin, because with hyperbolic metric, that's what the geodesics are. And because we're mapping from the track, and I should have said um, this is a disjoint one, i.e., the track is already contained in the half plane that it's going to be mapping into. And so if we take the pre-image of those geodesics, again, this is where I sort of have to wave slightly both my hands, but these come from these vertical geodesics here. So they get mapped over as appropriate. And they've got their own names as well. This is consistent with the paper again, but that's nothing to get hung up on. Okay. So hopefully, if I click again. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, big blue squiggles just jumped in there. So, if this tract did contain an unbounded component, it's got to do something of this kind, at least. It has to go through these wiggles. It has to pass through these geodesics. That's just it. It may wiggle. It may have some, I don't know. It may do awful things, but this is at least what we can sort of assume from it. Okay. Right, now this is where colors change. So 
I'm going to have to be careful with this. But say we've gone so far across to the right, you can pretend there's about another n or however many of these wiggles along. But if we look at this segment of the curve here, we've passed from this geodesic to this one. And this geodesic relates to this. And this one relates to this one. OK? So if we've passed between them, we must have passed between those. And by the construction, we have these semicircular arcs that sit in such a way that hopefully the colour changes are obvious. OK, so yep, that orange bit has now gone to this orange bit. Right. We've looked at the segments there. Let's look at the segments here. There's two here. So there's two distinct curves where we have a conformal isomorphism. So these must have come from two distinct paths. And once again, this geodesic refers to, uh, comes, pulls back to this geodesic under the isomorphism. And this geodesic comes from this one. So that means we had, if it catches up with me, Don't oh, one too fast. Okay, so sorry, that's, uh, this was hopefully for the benefit of people who couldn't see it all at once, but so you can see how that goes up. Oh, I've gone through that. But anyway, so now these two yellow segments, they're the ones now getting pulled back. So that means we've got two distinct curves up here. That's an issue. And purely because the scale's not great, I did try and add, add it in as well. Oh. Did that. oh, sorry, so I didn't get it in. But basically, there will be another two of these green geodesics up here where there will now be, so if you can imagine the geodesic cross here, pardon the waving hand. So there's now four segments. And that goes back and back and back and back. So now you end up, and spoiler alert if you already read it. So now at the very start of these red geodesics, that are, those are the ones labeled C. So at the very first one, so if I go back one, so if you can pretend that they're the very first ones and all of this had gone on earlier, at the very start, the first two now must have two to the K of these segments joining the first two of these red things. Supposing that you started treading backwards from K along. So that now means you've got two to the K segments and this holds for any K, which is the contradiction. And so there cannot be an unbounded curve in this tract going to infinity. Again, I've just very much hand waved through a lot of that, but the paper holds much more detail. OK, so I've not covered anything new yet, but this counterexample, following the prescription given in the paper, the order, sorry, the order is actually. 12L, where L is just an arbitrary constant bigger than 1. In the paper, you'll see it as 12M squared, but that can be reduced to 1 plus epsilon. But 12 and 1 are quite, there's a bit of a gap. So ideally, it's a rough upper bound. Apologies, I'm not being rude. Um, but my hope is to bring that down, bring that back as close to 1 as possible. And it's sort of a bit, as, again, where you're all playing concertos, I'm still learning Twinkle Twinkle. I would like to do an explicit version of this with a definite tract and definite um, details, full gory everything, just so it's been done. Because up to now, I don't think it, um, it's been quite so done in full explicit detail. And I mean, it's something to go from. And OK, so one of those. Um, any questions? Uh, 
So, any question? Uh, uh, let's take. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit slow in understanding the joke. I was not getting. That's all right. The end of the okay, day. questions. Sorry, right, don't have to. In my project so far, while I'm still doing it, it's just um, I've, I'm sort of looking now. Um, if anything, I've gone to real functions because we try and take with these tracts. So with this exponential, let's see if we can go back. Ideally, we would hopefully sort of link this to like a real function that's related to like logarithm to the power of or t to the one over a logarithm logarithm so it's got this ridiculous growth and i'm still going through lots of paper working on it um it seems to be on the way but that's where i am at up to now so i'd have liked it to have been ready for this conference but certainly but sorry yeah thank you for the question more questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker again. That's fine. Thank you all for your patience.